backtrack one, two. All right. Well, let's do this. Um, what we're going to do, I'm going to ask you if you could uh, find your way to Genesis 3, and we're going to continue through this, this little walk through the early chapters of, of Genesis. And uh, we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk through, I'm going to start by kind of doing a little presentation. We're going to get into Genesis 3, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some stuff that essentially happens um, p- post-Genesis 2, uh, what happens to uh, this, uh, this, this picture of human, uh, human sexuality. I, I, what I'm going to try to do is be done uh, around 11.45 with the presentation part and then create some space for some questions and response up to this point. And that, what hopefully that'll do is uh, give just a little bit of uh, buffer space for anything that kind of is unresolved in just the creation theology side. And then after lunch, we're going to get into the specifics of what is, for many of us, a real very important, what is for all of us a very important conversation around um, same-sex sexuality and how we think about that from a biblical theological uh, perspective, okay? So um, let's, let's, let's begin, though, um, uh, by just recognizing, um, uh, as, we, as, we, as we look at human sexuality, that we live in a, in a very weird time. Um, these are uh, the gods, this is the god uh, Aphrodite. Um, in, in the ancient Greco-Roman uh, 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 religious cult, there was a, a belief in a divine being who was essentially the god, yes? I'm using NIV. Yep, you can utilize whatever, tra- yeah, thank you, great question. Any other questions? Before? Okay. Nobody's asked what shirt I'm wearing. It's nice shoes, I feel, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm looking good up here. Um, uh, Aphrodite uh, was the, the, the god of human sexuality and, uh, and, and pleasure. And I, I bring up this image because um, w- one, of the, one of the things that, that uh, individuals who study ancient cosmologies uh, will point out, cosmology being your understanding of the beginning of the world, um, is, that, is that human cultures almost always tend to become the thing that they worship. Um, uh, for example, you're, you, did you notice at the beginning of Genesis 1, did you notice, well, you wouldn't notice in, unless you lived in the ancient world. In the ancient world, most cosmologies of various Canaanite religions, the Akkadians, the Babylonians, the Phoenicians, all these different religions, they almost always believed that there was some global universal battle, war, and earth is the spoils of of the victory. In essence, the earth is sort of the, 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 the victor's spoil of what, what, what the winner got. And you notice, how did creation begin? Does it begin with a war? No, it begins with God speaking, which is a subtle jab at those ancient cosmologies. God did not create with war. He creates with words. So, interesting, you know, Moses to bring water out of the rock, what does he do? He strikes the rock. So we call this biblical fracking. <laughs> right? He strikes the rock to bring out the liquid. He uses an act of violence to create. So violence, so, so Moses uses the, when God had told him to speak to the rock, by the way. Um, there's a whole conversation to be had about why did Moses strike the rock rather than speak to it? It actually turns out um, God, had, back in Exodus 17, had also told Moses there to strike the rock and water would come out. And yet in Numbers, God tells him to speak to the rock and he strikes it. And of course, why does Moses, rather than speaking to the rock, strike it? It's very simple. Um, he had done this before. And rather than being obedient, he is doing what he knows works. So, so disobedience for Moses is, is actually doing what works. Put, put that in your theology. And, and as a pastor, you know exactly what I'm talking about, of um, how often do we rely on, our, on what we know has worked in the past rather than being obedient to what God is saying today. This has nothing to do with what I was trying to say. So, in the ancient world, right, we all become what we worship. So if your God is a God of violence who has to war to get the earth, what are you bound to do? To be a violent people. 
if you worship the God of sexuality, licentiousness, you do you, what are you bound to do? There's a line in the prophets in the Old Testament that says, um, um, th there's this line that says something to the effect of, um, <clears throat> the people uh, the, the people follow or worship what the priests worship. Right? We are shaped by what we're looking at. I bring this up to say, I mean, it, 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 in, in many respects, I, I, I have to say, it feels to me like we have almost returned as a culture to Aphrodite worship where the end goal is sexual expression and freedom and pleasure. Um, Aphrodite is, we would never say our cult, nobody in Portland is like, I worship the god Aphrodite. But you don't have to use the word Aphrodite to recognize that you're certainly worshiping something other than the god of the Bible. So, in, you know, in, 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 a, in, a, in, in a way, go to the next slide. In, the, in a way, there's, there's this very interesting thing that happens um, in, in, the, in the text right after the humans are deceived, and I'm going to show you in just a second, is their relationship immediately after the human sin, and we're going to walk through Genesis 3 in a second, immediately after the human sin, their relationship with creation is inalterably changed. And what do the humans do once they um, are disobedient to God and break the one thing God told them to do, which was you can eat from any tree, but don't eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. What's the first thing that they do? They do two things. It's very, it's very, very prophetic. Um, the first thing that they do is they cover themselves with fig leaves. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. This is a very important moment in the story. They cover themselves in fig, fig leaves, and then what do they do? They run into the trees. Notice, notice, they start with covering themselves of something from the tree, and then they run to the trees. They move from covering themselves with the tree to making their identity the trees. They run into the trees, and now as they run into the trees, notice God comes to them, and that's a, that's a whole other cool part of the story is that God comes to them, but they have run into the trees. They have run to, away from the Lord. Notice that humans, when they sin, turn from the creator to creation. And this is, this is captured by Paul's language. In Romans 1, um, what, what, you know, what Paul is saying when he says Romans 1, 125, that classic line, is he's describing the human rebellion story. He, he's saying that when human beings turn away from God, they don't cease to exist, nor does God. What they do is they turn and worship created things rather than the creator. Their new identity, their sense of self, who they are, is no longer tied to the creator. They now find themselves rooted in the creation. This, this shift in human culture uh, is, is, is absolutely central to understanding what happens to humans in a post-Genesis 3 world. Is that you and I in our state of rebellion tend to turn to making created things our ultimate sense of identity. Uh, this is a, I'm gonna give you a quote from a guy named Eric Vogelein who is a political theorist. Um, and he, um, th this has, by the way, become quite normative to hear uh, people talk about. So, but this, this was back in the 1970s. And Vogelin, in one of his books, he was kind of a theologian and a philosopher, but he has this line where he says that one of the unique things that happens in a world where people no longer have religious lives, they no longer go to church, they no longer worship God, is that the secular person who used to worship God, when they stop worshiping God, they don't stop being worshipers, they have to find something else to worship. And, and Vogelin, who's a political theorist, he says actually what ends up happening is this destroys human society because eventually what happens is people begin to make their, their politics, their religion. 
So he's here, he's talking about political theory, and he says, when God is invisible behind the world, the contents of the world will become new gods. When the symbols of transcendent religiosity are banned, new symbols become from the, developed from the inner world language of science will take their place. Like the Christians, the inner worldly community has its apocalypse too, yet the new apocalyptics insist that the symbols they create are scientific judgments. What, he, what he's saying here is he's saying w- that in a world that has, has been unhitched from the worship of God, that the impulse to worship must grab onto something. Nobody cannot worship. The human being must worship something. I mean, I, I, in many respects, friends, we, in the next 30, 40, 50 years, um, mark, your, mark, your, mark your calendars. Elections will just get harder. Because we are no longer talking about politics. We are talking about people's religious identity. Who you vote for now has nothing to do with your politics. It has to do with who you are as a person. Do you see what's going on here? Is that in the past we used to argue about theology and how to do worship and liturgy. But that's no longer our identity as a culture. So we have to find something else to be our identity. And in many respects, politics has played that role. It has filled the gap of true worship. Ronald Rollheiser is a Catholic theologian. I love his work. He's absolutely, read everything he's, he's written. He says, many people while rejecting any explicit belief in God or any other absolute invariably set up certain ideals as normative and then invest these ideals with an absoluteness that mimics and parallels every movement of religion. You move away from an explicit love of God and you still have an impulse to love something as though it is God. This has had a profound impact on human sexuality. Because it is, in the end, it is idolatry. Let's define idolatry, by the way. When you and I think of idolatry, we tend to think of worshiping bad things, right? You're worshiping evil, dark spirits, and worshiping uh, statues and idols and these sorts of things. Can that be idolatry? Yes. But more often than not, friends, idolatry is not humans worshiping evil things. More often than not, idolatry is humans worshiping good things of turning towards making good things their identity, their sense of self. This is how Dallas Willard defines idolatry. He calls it a human attempt to use human means to achieve identity and power for the individual. We, we use politics as our idol because it gives us a sense of self. We use uh, our conversations about sexuality, that my sexual identity and expression is the truest thing about me. And and a Christian understanding of identity has such a profoundly different understanding of human identity. You know, our our, our culture would say, you do you. Here's my problem with that. You do you. Okay, well, okay, let me me flesh that out. I gotta be very honest. I am very different on Mondays than I am on Fridays. And the kind of things I want on Friday mornings are very different than the things I want on Friday nights. If you're gonna tell me you do you, here's my problem. What you do you want me to do? Because I keep changing. And if my you, friends, let's, I, there are some things I want to do that if I actually did them, it would destroy my family. It would annihilate trust. It would harm so many people. Let's be honest. Thank God I don't you do you. The last thing I should be doing is me. To say nothing of the fact that Jesus says <laughs> that your job is to deny yourself and actually take up my cross. The Christian story is not about you doing you. The Christian story is about you not doing you and doing what Jesus says. Human idolatry is to say, I'm not gonna take what God has said about myself. I'm going to do what what I want my identity to be. And and, and ultimately, the, the, the devastation that comes with that decision is a generation of young people who have endless anxiety and angst because who they are keeps changing from day to day. If you're gonna tell somebody to be you and you're a sinner, God, that is, that is hell on earth. No wonder teenagers are taking their lives. That is an unsustainable way to live a human life. This has had huge effects on human sexuality. And, and by the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give to you some, some, some language from somebody who's not even a Christian. So just to make, my, to make this as, as solid of a point as possible so you realize this is not just some, some guy up on a stage who loves the Bible making this case. This is Ernest Becker's book, The Den- Denial of Death. I don't know if you've read this book. It won the Pulitzer Prize back in the 1990s. Ernest, Beck, Ernest Becker is, a, is an atheist. He is not interested in any way, shape, or form. 
to try to convince you that a Christian human sexual ethic is a good ethic. He wrote a book called The Den Denial of Death, and the big idea of this book is this, is that when human culture, when, when the modern West became increasingly secular, that meant that people no longer had an understanding of the afterlife. And what ends up happening in a culture, he argues, again, this won the Pulitzer Prize, is that essentially what that means is culture increasingly doesn't know what to do with death. We deny it. We don't have funerals anymore. We have celebrations of life. Nobody dies. They're with us. They're in our hearts. And the whole, the whole premise of this book is that what happens in secular culture is that we don't know what to do with death when you don't have an afterlife. It's actually, it's a very, it's a brilliant book. And Charles, I'm, I'm gonna guess you read it given how much you're nodding up here. Okay, go read it. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. In the middle of the book, he talks about sex. And this is what he says. He, 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 and it's almost a throwaway line, but you gotta pay close attention to it. He's talking about how we don't know how to deal with, with death when we no longer have God. And he says the same thing happens with romance. Is that eventually what happens is you know, if you no longer worship God, you will eventually begin to make romance, sex, and intimacy your new God. And, and this is what he's talking, he's talking about a guy who's made his way into his counseling office and how, um, and how he is expected to be the hero perfect because his wife needs him to be her God. And he says this, this man still needed to feel heroic, to know that his life mattered in the scheme of things. He still had to merge himself with some higher self-absorbing meaning in trust and gratitude because if he no longer had God, how was he to do this? One of the first ways was the romantic solution the self-glorification that he needed in his innermost nature, he now looked for in the love partner. The love partner becomes the divine ideal within which to fill one's life. All spiritual and moral needs now become focused on one individual. In one word, the love object is God. Man reached for a vow when the worldview of the great religious community overseen by God had died. The failure of romantic love in the modern secular West as a solution to human problems is so much a part of the modern man's frustration no human relationship can bear the burden of godhood. However, much we may idealize and idolize the person we love, he inevitably reflects earthly decay and imperfection. Listen to this. If your partner is your all, then any shortcoming in him becomes a major threat to you. What he, is, he is describing, friends, why so many of the young people that I serve are having the most difficult time finding somebody to marry. Because we have turned romance into the ideal divine experience. My, my, I've been married now for 21 years. My wife has had a lot of time to think about her decision. <laughs> and I will tell you right now, the only reason our marriage has made it is because she loves Jesus more than she loves me. And the only reason that our marriage has worked is because I love God more than I love my wife. And if I no longer believed in, in God, I can tell you our marriage would not work because I would turn her into my God and she is a horrible God. <laughs> and I'm a horrible God. But when you no longer have a God, you have to have some God. No wonder marriages don't work today. We are worshiping, we are sleeping with our God. And it doesn't work. And so what we end up doing is we end up taking, by the way, the New York Times literally calls hookup culture apocalyptic romance. It is like we are trying to find our ultimate sense of identity in that one hookup that will just be everything for us. If that is what you are looking for, it is a life of heartbreak, pain, and toil. And if you don't believe me, come and sit in my office hour appointments and let me tell you stories. Friends, John is crystal clear, is he not? John is crystal clear. What is love? God is love, which means when John says this in 1 John 4, 8, this, this idea of God being love is such an important theological concept for even understanding what happens before God created the world. You know, when God created the world in Genesis 1, 1, have you ever wondered what God was doing in Genesis 1, 0? What was he doing? What was he up to? And friends, we don't know what, what he was doing, but we know who he was. That before God created the universe, before God created you, before God created me, God is love. Notice, God does not love, God is love. 
It's his nature. It's his ontological being. God is love. And a world that no longer has God still has to have love. And so our secular approach takes the creator and swaps it in for a created thing. And in our world, God is not love. Love is love. And friends, that, no wonder it doesn't, it can't work. Because we are placing on human love divine status. Only God can be love. Only God is love. Are you with me? So what happens after the garden? Find a way to Genesis 3. When God creates all things in Genesis 1 and 2, I mean, it is, it's this beautiful beginning to the human story. There's intimate, intimacy, there's friendship, there's life, there's good food. There's sex. Sex existed before the fall. They don't start having sex after the fall. Friends, it, it is good. It's glorious. It's beautiful. And then Genesis 3. Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God has made. Let me pause there for just a moment. And just for one moment, if, if you are ever going to preach a sermon series on spiritual warfare or the powers of the evil, that one verse we just read has more to say to us about the powers of darkness than any, probably any verse in the Bible. Notice his name. Now the serpent was more crafty. Notice his name. His name is actually, ironically, it's not a name. Uh, the word that is used here is the word nachash, N-A-C-H-A-S-H, nachash. And nachash is actually not a name. My name is AJ, by the way, AJ. A title of me, my title would be doctor, reverend, father, you know, teacher, blazer fan, whatever. It's been a bad year to be a blazer fan, but... Do you notice the difference between a personal name and a title? Okay. By the way, in Genesis 1, God's name is Elohim, which is a title. Genesis 2, God's name is Yahweh, which is his personal name. We get his title and his name, his personal name. But in Genesis 3, when we are introduced to the serpent, we do not get a name, we only get a title. Nachash is not a name, it is a title for a snake. Now, this is not going to be the only time in the Bible in which somebody's name will be withheld to make a point. For example, go to Exodus chapter 1, and you'll notice that Pharaoh commands all the baby boys to be killed, all the children to be killed. And there are these Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua. Do you remember these two Hebrew midwives who saved the lives of the babies? Now, when you think, okay, that's an interesting story. Pharaoh orders the killing of the children but guess what? Is Pharaoh a name? It's a title. In fact, there were hundreds of Pharaohs. The Bible never tells us his name. <laughs> this is interesting because the Bible doesn't tell us the name of Pharaoh, but it does give us the name of two Hebrew midwives that save babies. This is called biblical trash talk. <laughs> and what the author is doing is saying the, the only ones that are worth remembering are the Hebrew women who saved the babies. Pharaoh is just another Pharaoh. His name is Nachash. That's his title. He goes unnamed. The Bible actually never gives us his name. His name is not Lucifer. That is a Latin translation of Morning Star from the book of, uh, from one of the prophets. That's not his name. Beelzebub potentially could be his name, but the, the Bible, uh, Satan, is actually an adjective. It means the opposer or the adversary. So we are not given his name. All we're told is he's the Nachash. And we're told that he is, in Hebrew, he is crafty. Uh, the Hebrew word here is arum. And it is incidentally arum. It is the same Hebrew word that is used in the book of Proverbs for prudent and wise. Now this goes against much of what we were taught, is that the Satan figure is stupid, he's, he's ignorant, he's dumb, 
when in reality, the first time he is described is he's actually described as brilliant. He's very wise. He's not wise in the God sense. He's wise in a dark sense. There is an evil wisdom that is self-centered and not centered on God. He's brilliant. He's crafty. And then the author says, you saw, that he was more crafty than any of the other wild animals the Lord God had made. Who created the serpent? God did. Now, the debate, of course, is did he create him evil? No, he didn't create him evil. The serpent was a good creature before he fell, which means that he comes into the garden having already gone through some kind of fall. Genesis 3 is not the fall. It is a fall. There has already been some sort of fall that took place before this story. And he comes in as a creature that God has made. Friends, he's a creation. He's not an eternal being. C.S. Lewis always loved to say this. When you think about Satan and God, don't think about this as two equals battling it out. This is not a fair war. This is not a fair battle. <laughs> this is not a fair battle. This is a battle between a creator and a creation. It's not a fair fight. God made this guy. So he comes in. He's coming in hot because he's already gone through some fall. And he says to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Which is, of course, something God never told her. Nor did God tell the man. God, in fact, God had said you could eat from any tree in the garden except from one. And so the woman says to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must eat, not eat from the tree that's in the middle of the garden and we must not touch it or we will die. And you will notice, and you probably preached on this at some point, is that the woman at this moment in time has just added something to the commandment of God. God had never said you must not touch it. They could have built a tree house in the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and I think God would have been fine with it. He said, she never, he never says, don't touch it. And she, in the words of F uh, Frederick Dale Brunner, who's one of my favorite commentators, uh, he says, uh, the woman in this story, and by the way, don't think I'm going to bash women here because the dude has a very clear part in this story, um, but she becomes the first Pharisee in the Bible, adding to God's word. So she has added to what God had said, that you should not eat. And if you notice in the Bible, every time there is something added to God's word, the serpent is always nearby. In the Garden of Eden, and in Matthew chapter four, when Jesus goes into the desert and is tempted by the serpent, if you look at the serpent's quotations of the Old Testament, he either adds or omits lines from the Psalms when he is twisting his point. So whenever something is added or subtracted from scripture, the serpent is always nearby. Whenever something is added or subtracted from Scripture, something is, the serpent is nearby. I'm going to say that again. When something is added or subtracted to Scripture, the serpent is somewhere nearby. And the serpent says, no, you're not going to die, for God knows, and that's D.A. Carson in one of his books. Um, he start, the serpent starts with a question, and then immediately he turns to, you're not going to die, and D.A. Carson says, this is the very first doctrine that the serpent deniably uh, contradicts, and it is the doctrine of judgment. You're not going to die. You do you. Everything's fine. No judgment. And it's brilliant, because if he can get judgment out of the way, he can get you to do anything else. It's absolutely brilliant. If he can get the doctrine of judgment out of the way, he can get you to do anything else. Um, I, I may sound, I, I don't know, again, I, I'm, I, I don't know you all, I know Charles, I know a few of you, but um, this is actually why um, I, I would argue Genesis 3 is the greatest argument for why you and I must guard and protect the doctrine of hell. Um, that, by the way, there are different ways to understand hell, and I'm open to those different differences of, of, of interpretation, but what we cannot do is say there is no judgment, because that is exactly what the serpent does. No judgment, because if he can get this judgment out of the way, he can get you to do anything. Are, are you with me? When you realize that you are accountable to God and will actually give account, it changes the way you live your life. You're not gonna die, he says. 
For God knows that when you eat from the tree, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Knowing good and evil. Man, he's brilliant. Because he, look what he says here. And you will be, if you eat from this tree that God said not to eat from, you will be like God. If you do this, you will be like God. If you do this, you will be like God. What does that imply? He is subtly insinuating that she wasn't already like God. Go, go to Matthew 4. Jesus in the desert. And the serpent comes to Jesus and says to Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, the serpent says to Jesus, if you bow down and worship me, what does the serpent tell Jesus? If you bow down and worship me, the serpent tells him what? I will give you the, the nations. What does that subtly imply? That Jesus doesn't already have them. And I want you to notice, from Genesis 3 to Matthew 4, it's the same temptation. If you do what I say, I will give you something. The devil's number one gift is he always offers us something we already have in Christ. And it is baked into our culture's conversation about sexuality. If you embrace this part of you, you will find your identity. The assumption is you don't already have an identity. And I want to say in Jesus' name, you already have an identity because God has spoken over you. And when God has spoken, what man says means nothing. She was already like God. She was made in the image of God. He's brilliant. He's absolutely brilliant. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took and she ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. You know, it is pretty common in theological circles. It is common, unfortunately, in churches to hear something like this. You know, the, the man came first. The man came first before the woman, so therefore the man is more important than the woman. Um, uh, okay. Well, if you're going to say that, then you must be ready to say um, that jellyfish are more important than men because they came before the man. The logic breaks down pretty quick when you say that because somebody came first, they're more important than the other. No, the man is not more important than the man. They are both important equally before God, created in the image of God. There would be another side that would say something like this. Man, had the woman not listened to the serpent, we wouldn't be in this predicament and it's used as sort of a subtle jab at women for being failures, and you're the ones, you're the reason we've all fallen. And I just want to point out to you, friends, yes, the woman's first sin was that she added to what God had said, but if you read very carefully verse 6, who was standing there the entire time? The man was watching. The woman's first sin is that she added to what God said, but the man's first sin is passivity. He watches. And if I had a dollar for every therapist in my life who has sat with young men who had dads who weren't there but were just working or spent their life watching TV, we are playing this story out over and over and over again. The man was right there. And the eyes of both of them were open and they were naked. Verse seven. And look what they do. Oh my gosh, oh, makes me want to cry. So they sewed fig leaves together and made a covering. Anybody in the room have a fig tree? I got a fig tree. Have you ever felt a fig leaf? What's it feel like? It feels like sandpaper. You can be honest with yourself. If there is a tree leaf that you would want to put on those parts of your body, it wouldn't be a fig leaf. You would never want to put a fig leaf on those parts of your body. I have a fig leaf, a fig tree. I can tell you that it, it would be so profoundly uncomfortable. 
So you gotta ask yourself a question. Why a fig leaf? What did they just eat? There's a huge debate. Some people think, well, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, the one tree they weren't supposed to eat from was an apple. Couldn't be an apple. Apples don't grow in the Middle East. Some people think a pomegranate. It could have been a pomegranate. I think the text tells us. What did they just eat from? You would never put those leaves on your body unless you were standing right there. They are immediately covering their shame with a fig leaf. And it is the fig tree that leads to the curse. Just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. And as Jesus walks into Jerusalem, there's a tree that Jesus curses. What kind of tree was it? What is Jesus undoing? He is undoing, he is cursing the tree that led to the curse. But notice they clothe themselves with fig leaves. Pay close attention. I told you in our first session, and I know you were hearing, you were listening. I saw note takers. I made the case, who invented diversity? Who created a world where species were different? Who created a world where a man's body and a woman's body are different? Who created the difference between bone structures and brain structures and emotions and bodies and sexual desires? Who created the difference? God made that. And the first thing humans do after the fall is they cover up their differences. It is God's world where beings look different. It is Satan's world where everybody starts looking the same. I can have, friends, I can have profound grace on my friends who wrestle with gender dys dysphoria. And I do. I have students who wrestle with gender dysphoria who feel like they are in the wrong body. I have profound compassion. And I, friends, the, we don't serve anybody by belittling people's experience. There are people that wake up in the, in the morning that feel like they are in, a, in the wrong body. But I gotta tell you, hands down, my greatest anger and frustration about the concept of transgender ideology and, and, and uh, gender, transgenderism as a whole is it is an implicit message you were born wrong. And that the differences of your body are a problem that must be changed. We are creating a sexless, genderless world where there is no beautiful difference between a man and a woman. And I wanna say those differences were made by God and they're good and they're beautiful and the little body of a 13-year-old girl is not a mistake. And the boy of a 15, little 15-year-old boy who thinks that his body is a mistake, no, God doesn't make bad stuff. That is what humans do, is that we want to cover the differences because the differences of God are our glory. They're our glory. Notice that the serpent does not come after God because the serpent can't do anything about God's glory. The only thing the serpent can do is to go after the beings that reflect God's glory. Serpent can't do anything about God's glory, but he can come after those that, that, that reveal God's glory. 
there is an assault on the human person. I want my 12-year-old son to wake up in the morning and know that that little body God has put him in is a beautiful, glorious body. And that he is not a mistake. I would say it is oppressive to tell somebody you're in the wrong body. That's oppressive. That's oppression. Did you know the earliest Christians, true story, did you know the earliest Christians, (laughs) when you and I get baptized, you know we do the robe thing, we get like hot tub baptismals and stuff at churches, we like, you get these hot tubs and put on the robes and stuff. Did you know this? That for the first 300 years of the church, when you became a Christian, they would take you down to a river and you would get baptized naked because when you're in Jesus, you are back to your shameless state. Do you know what the gospel does? The gospel looks at the body of a 12-year-old child and looks at your body and says, your body is good. And it is, and it shines God's glory. It is the devil's world that wants to cover up the glory of God. The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They could hear him because he was actually there. But the Lord called to the man. He says, where are you? This is so, God comes to them. God comes to them. God, friends, when you, if you and I think that God banishes them from the garden, yes, God banishes them, but not the way you think he does. If you think God looks at their sin and he's like, get out of here. Notice who ran away. It was God who ran, it was not God who ran away. It was the humans who ran away. And he comes to them. He comes to them. And he says to them, where are you? Did he not know what they did? He knew what they did. He is not being mean. Friends, he is inviting confession. Just tell me what you did. But they run, and eventually they're going to be banished. And it's not a mistake, friends, because eventually the word for banished, they are banished to the east of the Garden of Eden. Eventually they are banished, and it is not a mistake that in Hebrew the word for banished is the same word as the word for divorce. It is not just that they are no longer in the garden. Their relationship with God has been annihilated. But it is them who run. God just creates space for them to continue on the path that they have already chosen. He answered, I heard in the garden, and it was, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And, <clears throat> and then God says, who told you that you're naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put me here, she gave me some of the fruit. And all of a sudden, you begin to notice the war between the sexes. What was intended to be a relationship of mutuality, kindness, love, and mercy turns to enmity and hatred. She did it. She did it. Then the Lord says to the woman, what is this you've done? What does she say? She blames the serpent. He did it. The serpent told me to do it, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and all the wild animals, and he, he curses, he curses the, the serpent. He doesn't curse the humans. He just, he, he tells them this, the, the response of what is going to happen. The man will rule over you, which is not something God wants. It's what will happen in a world formed by sin and darkness. Verse 21 is the last part I want to read. So the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. They had already clothed themselves. This is interesting. Why would God need to clothe them as well? I ran away from home once when I was 14. Um, I'd never run away, but I'd seen people on TV do it. And so I got a can of tuna fish, and 
uh, I put it in a little knapsack on my, with a stick because I thought that's what you did and I left the house. And I go and sit under a tree in a park behind my house for one hour and then realized I was hungry and I didn't have a can opener. <laughs> so I was back home very quickly. Um, you have two humans here who are running away and you have a God who is blessing them as they run away. And I want you to notice, you just saw the very first thing in the Bible. It's never happened before. God makes garments of skin for the humans. What just happened for the very first time in the Bible? There's been a death. And you will notice from here on out in the Bible, every time there's forgiveness, mercy, and grace, there is always blood. And he, cl- he kills an animal, clothes them, and they go away. The Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, good and evil, knowing good and evil, and he banishes them out of the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which you t- have been taken. If you would um, go to the next slide. Or, I'm sorry, I've got my own slides here. I want you to see three things that happen as a result of sin. And friends, this impacts human sexuality on such a deep, reverberating, clear level. Number one is the humans, after the fall, their first move is that they reject the differences that God has created them with. They cover themselves with fig leaves. Heterogeneity becomes the mark of God's world, but homogeneity is the mark of the serpent's world, a world where nobody is different, everybody looks the same. And God's now vision of a world where God's glory is revealed through the differences of the man and the woman now become covered over, and the result is they now look the same. Immediately after this story, if you were to continue to read Genesis 2, you would find in the very next chapter, friends, this is Genesis 4. The very first line, by the way, is really interesting. Genesis 4.1 says, Adam made love to his wife. This creates a problem. What did we never see in the Garden of Eden? There was no marriage ceremony. So how could he be her, wife, her husband? There was no wedding. It assumes there was a wedding. And if there was a wedding in the Garden of Eden, who was the one who did the wedding? Who would have done the wedding? God! Where does Jesus do his first miracle? At a wedding. This is a God who loves weddings. He created it and he makes a wedding the first place where he does the first miracle. Friends, marriage is God's ideal. And the idea of the marriage between a man and a woman, that is God's design. God made it, it's God's vision. And God made a world in which a man and a woman would be married for life. This is the vision of God. And it cannot be a mistake because in the next chapter, one of the descendants from Cain and Abel, Cain kills Abel, the first thing that happens after the Garden of Eden is a murder. I mean, you would think that humans would take a little time to get into their iniquity. They do a swan dive. They just jump right on in. We're just going to start killing each other. And the next story, murder, the next story is that the son of Cain, Lamech, marries two women. You and I have a word for this. It's called polyamory. And it's the idea that, you know, we, we, the design of one and one, a man and a woman, ah, doesn't really matter. Friends, it is the next chapter. Polygamy and polyamory are the first reflections of marriage after the Garden of Eden. And somebody could go, okay, well, the Bible, the Bible has a lot of stories of polygamy, right? And by the way, it does! I had a student who said to me once, I said, they said, do you realize how many polygamists there are in the Bible? And I said, yes. And he goes, does that mean we can be? Because the truth is, all of them are. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, everyone, your heroes were all polygamists. But if you look carefully, every single time polygamy is mentioned in the Bible, the next story is a story of murder or oppression. And the Bible is making a very important point. When you tinker with God's understanding of marriage, it leads to violence. It cannot be a mistake. Lamech marries two women, and then as he speaks to them, he writes a poem to them. And in his poem, he says, Zilha and Bilha, 
I have murdered a man. <laughs> Violence is baked into polygamy. Violence is baked into polyamory. If you think for one second our culture is unique for coming up with polyamory, get in your Bible, folks. It's the first chapter after Genesis 3. This is nothing new. There is nothing unique about our culture's obsession. By the way, the New York Times just did a full spread on how creative and interesting polyamory is of multiple partners connecting with multiple partners. I have walked with polyamorous couples, and I will tell you that it always leads to heartbreak. Every time. Marriage is distorted. It is broken. Lamech now marries two women. It's the first chapter after Genesis 3. And perhaps most notably is that that intimacy between the man and the woman where they were to walk side by side, which, by the way, notice, when God created, it's really interesting. Anybody know? Anybody know? Pop quiz. Pop quiz. You ready? Pop quiz. Students. What is the first healing in the Bible? I need some real Bible nerds. You gotta go deep on this one. Where's the first healing in the Bible? The first healing in the Bible is when God cuts Adam in the side. I want you to think about this. The first healing in the Bible is God heals a wound that he created. Adam would have had a scar in his side for the rest of his life. Can anybody else think of somebody in the Bible who has a scar in their side? In fact, when the woman was created out of the man, the man is cut and is created the first bride. And when Jesus is cut in the side, the bride of Christ is being created. I want you to notice, though, they are side by side. And all the rabbis, this is like a common theme, the woman did not come out of the head, didn't come out of the feet. What part of the body did she come out of? The side it is implied that they are to walk side by side. And the first thing that happens after the fall is God comes to the man and he says to the man, or to the woman, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. And so many of you have heard that and thought God is commanding that. God is saying, I want you to rule over the woman or I want the man to rule over you. God is not commanding this, he is grieving this. This is not a commandment. God is saying this is what happens in a world of sin is that women are ruled over by men. They were meant to walk side by side, but now the man will rule over the woman. God never wanted that. They were to walk side by side. And that mutuality of the man and the woman walking together has now been changed. Now, I'll tell you right now, by the way, my, my theory on this. Some people disagree with me on this, but it doesn't matter because I'm right. If you look very carefully at Genesis 1 and 2, what is the woman's name? What is her name? What is, I'll ask you this. What is she never called? She is not Eve. She is not called Eve once in Genesis 1 and 2. Because in the ancient world, friends, to name something meant you had power over that thing. What does God tell the man he can do with the animals? Name them. Because to name means you have power over the thing. I named my son. He did not name himself. There's, because naming is about power. It's about power. When somebody, when somebody comes out as, as another gender, what's the first thing that they do? It's a self-naming. It's, it's a way of saying, you no longer have power over me. I have power over me. He never tells, God never tells the man that he can name her. Her name is the woman. And if you look very carefully, folks, the very first thing God does, uh, the very first thing Adam does after the fall, in verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve. He never was given permission to do this. He is taking authority over her, and he is now ruling over her. Her name was not Eve, her name is woman. And if you look very carefully, what does Jesus always call the women in the Gospels? Woman. 
He is restoring their identity. In a world where you have been ruled, Jesus restores your true identity. You are what he says about you. But that human side-by-sideness, it is lost. And the man now rules over the woman, and friends, heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. Um, what I'm trying to get you to see here is that the world that God created had a world where sexuality was beautiful, it was glorious, it was good, it was what God wanted, it was guarded, it was protected, it had boundaries, it was good, it was good, it brought life. And you get one chapter in to the fall. And God's design for marriage, friends, it crumbles in a chapter. And we have had thousands and thousands of years of getting to see what that world looks like. And what you and I are seeing on the news, what we're seeing in our classrooms, what we're seeing in our church, friends, this is not just our culture running, going weird. This is what happens when we do life without God. And it's horrible. It's horrible. We really need Jesus. When I was a child, um, I had had, as I mentioned to you, some unchosen sexual experiences. And these Uh, dynamics were very powerful for me and have been very powerful for me. I've, I've wrestled with sexual desires my entire adult life that I wish that I did not have and I know without a question they are the result of those experiences and not having a dad in the room when I was a kid. I know that. And those, those internal desires have been, have been extraordinarily painful for me since I met Jesus. Honestly, I just wish, like, I wish, like, when I had followed Jesus, all that stuff just went away, and I didn't wrestle with it, and it didn't, it didn't have power in my life. And, and it, it has, it just, it just, it, for years, it just, it won't get, it doesn't go away. And two Decembers ago, I made the most important decision of my adult life. Uh, I hired my therapist for four days to go away with, three, with me for three days, for four days, to simply let me tell the stories of what happened to me as a kid because I'd never dealt with it. I had been hiding it, ignoring it, pretending like it wasn't real, and I had never dealt with it. And I said, I need to go away with you, and I need you to just listen to me. And I went away for four days. I paid him very well. And I allowed my childhood to be heard for the first time. As I was driving home from this experience, you remember when when Jesus said the phrase, he said, let the children come to me. I have always thought of that as Jesus saying, literally, like, let kids come to me, and I do think that's what he means, but as I was driving home from, from my four days with my therapist, I sensed the Lord interrupt me with a new way to imagine that teaching and that for the first time what I was actually doing was letting my inner child come to Jesus. And you know what I discovered two Decembers ago? Is that Jesus can even heal retroactively. We just must be willing to come. In this world of brokenness, of sin and and, and evil and darkness that we are seeing happen, I understand our impulse to want to say the ideas are wrong, but I want to say the problem is not the ideas. The problem is that, that we don't know Jesus. That is our hope. That is our hope. And that Jesus has the healing power our world needs. And you and I hold forth the word of life. Guard it. I want to take some questions. Um, We just ripped the band-aid off for nearly three hours, and I probably offended all of you multiple times. Um, 
or at least alienated you on some level. So let's create some space for questions. And then we're going to do some lunch, and then we're going to keep, keep going. Are you finding this helpful? Okay. Yeah, do we have a mic somewhere? Ah, here we go. There's that. Uh, what I ask, just raise your hand. And if I said something, or you want clarification, or you want to, you name it. Come on, you're Baptist. You know how to ask good questions. Give me your, if you could, your name oh, too, just so My I name is Andrew. Hi, Andrew. So how do you balance grace and truth when mm. someone, you know, wants to be identified by other pronouns? Yes. Do you go along with what they want, call them oh, my goodness. she, he, as opposed to their gender, yep. or yep. do you yep. go on the side of grace and yep. call them what they want? Um, what's your name? Andrew. Andrew, thank you. Can I just make an observation? Uh, Andrew, I have done this presentation that I'm doing here I don't know how many times. Can I just make an observation? 90% of the time, the first question is the exact question you just asked. And, and that is not shaming your question. It's a very important question, but I want to just point out how immediately we go to the practical, what do we do on the ground in light of all this stuff? And I want to say to you, Andrew, okay, there are some ways to think about that, but I also want you to know that the challenge of figuring out how to address somebody with a pronoun is not a problem, it is a gift because it is forcing you to your knees in prayer to actually need God. What I'm trying to say is, what if we saw that as a problem that could cause us to go deeper in our theology and our Bible than anything else? Now, if you're asking me what I would do, I'll tell you what I would do. As an academic, um, I have a certain degree of requirement as an academic in a major university of things I'm required to do. So an example would be, um, you know, like um, I have accommodations for my students. I don't get to distinguish between somebody with a disability or not. I must serve all students based on their accommodation. Um, those sorts of things. As a, as a professor, in my role at the university, um, I would be inclined to practice what a number of people call gender hospitality, which is that um, I would likely, by virtue of my role in their life, and by the way, anyone in this room who has a, is a public school teacher, you could lose your job over this stuff. So this is like, you know, this is, but I would generally speaking in an instance like that, not be required to, but I would be inclined to address somebody as they, um, as they have been opted to, as, as they've chosen. But, but here's the, the flip side of that, is that I feel really uncomfortable with that because I don't want to affirm something that I know that in a few years they may disagree with or that they, that they know is a sin. So I feel very torn about that because I think there are moments, my goodness gracious, um, I think there are moments that if we called a child by their ch chosen pronoun at the age of 14, folks, 85% of kids that go through gender dysphoria after they finish puberty go away from gender dysphoria. And for me to call them by their chosen pronoun is actually almost celebrating something that I know that they're not going to think in 10 years. So I feel very torn. And I think in instances like that, Andrew, goodness gracious, we should be praying a lot, talking with each other a lot, and trying to use the best discernment that we can with what God has given to us. I don't know if there's a, a rule I can put down because frankly, as I said at the beginning, I am supposed to go as far as scripture says. And I don't see a text where Paul deals with the issue of gender pronouns in the way that I wish. Yep. You, you know, what we could do is just call them by their name. Because ultimately a name is more powerful than a pronoun. Like, ca just call them by their name. <laughs> you sidestep the whole thing by treating them like a human. Um, with a name, yeah. So I'm, I'm, really, I'm really torn on this. I mean, um, I have friends like Preston Sprinkle, who's a very close friend of mine, who would practice something he calls gender hospitality, which is that it's, it's actually a sign of your hospitality to call somebody by the name they're chosen. But if you look at somebody like a, a Rosaria Butterfield, she would say that's a sin to do that. Um, and I don't like it. <sighs> I'm, I'm, I'm a little, you know, um, yeah. Um, I think we need a little time to process this as a church. Like, let's, it's brand new, 
we should take some. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here's my thoughts. It's wildly complicated. Yeah, and it requires a spirit-anointed person to trust in God, to actually get on your face in prayer and ask God for God's help. Would you please, yeah. What, uh, can we get a, a microphone? Yeah. Ah, like a legal name change. Yes. That um, I, she, she went to her counselor and said that I couldn't call her. Uh, yeah. She or he because I mean a she because she's a he. Yes. And so she went to change her name in court, and so now she changed it from Marissa to Maxwell. Uh, so I guess you have to go by their name when they get it in court, right? Uh, but it's been a hard change. Yes, and, and to add, to, what's your name? Sharon. Sharon, thank you, Sharon. I have, and I have a transgender granddaughter, and then I have a grandson, and they're both, they, he's gay. And yes. they're both the same mom oh, as sure. my daughter. Yes. So it's been a hard thing. Yes. And they, they want to be called what they are, but I've got a grandson that he's reaching out to me and my husband because we're his grandparents, and he's saying that when he's around us, he, my husband didn't want to be around him at first. So he uh, just, yeah, it was but, too hard. But I too said, hard. I think we need to when he wants to be with us. We just tell uh, him he can't come with his partner. Uh, he wants to stay with us. Yes. He lives in Vancouver, and I live in Chehalis. So what he done is told us that he feels different when he's with us, that he feels a happiness. Mm. So, um, mm. I, we're taking him to Canada, so I don't know how that's going to go. Yes. So I just told him I don't want him talking about the stuff with his partner. Yeah, I get it's it. It's just an awful thing. You know, I was yeah. going to ask that same question. It's so hard. You don't know what to do. So it's yeah. been the best thing. Yeah. Sharon, thank, Sharon, thank you for your vulnerability with all of us. No, thank you. Can, can I just... Um, it, and it, it is, frankly, it is, it is uh, even more complicated by a new, a, a new thing that's going on, unfortunately, of uh, a trans or, 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 or whatnot kids who are now cutting off parents and grandkids who do not go by what they, they say. And um, that is just, I, I, I mean, yeah. Yes, of course. And he's been trying to persuade me to huh. him, huh. but then he keeps bringing it back up. And it's, it's caused a lot of problems. Yes. Well, Sharon, um, I think your name, you're putting your finger on what many of us feel, like the affective feeling emotion to this. Here's what I feel when a student comes out to me, is, is I feel this deep sense of like, um, not that they would say this, but I feel like, should I change what I know is true in order to accommodate to this scenario? Like, should I, and this almost emotional pressure to, to, to bend on things that we know are true. And, and I would invite you, in a, in a way, like, to embrace that as God's way of developing deep perseverance in you. Because what that, what that is doing to you, Sharon, is that is... That is putting on full display, are you, are you gonna hold faithfully what you know God has revealed? And those emotions are very powerful. And I just, but the minute we start making theological decisions based on emotions, that's such a dangerous trajectory. As hard as it is, Sharon, and some of, I have family members who are gay, my brother-in-law is gay, my, step, my stepbrother's gay, and we are together every Thanksgiving and Christmas, and yes, there are moments that are hard but we do the world and our friends and our kids a service by remaining faithful till we know what we know what, it, what is true. Stay faithful, Sharon, as hard as it is. Yes, she dragged you in, as it were. You have a good friend, you have a good friend, you have a good friend. Have a good friend. Yeah, um, actually, I don't have a picture of it, um, or, or do I? Um, do I have it here? Um, hold on just a sec. Hold on. Let me just look, look at something real quick. 
Do I have it? Um, I don't have it here. Um, just a, a beautiful story of a young man, um, uh, and I have a picture of a, a young man getting baptized um, on Easter, two Easter's ago at a church in Salem, Oregon. My friend pastors a church, and a young man uh, got saved in this church, and uh, he, there's a picture of him getting baptized. He's coming up out of the water, and his story was during COVID, he moved to Portland. Um, he uh, transitioned, became a, 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 a presenting female in his time in Portland, and during COVID, um, his world just fell apart, and he began to seek God, and he came to church on a Sunday, and he met Jesus, and it's a picture of him getting baptized, and he would say now, looking back, his parents would not be okay, did, were not okay with everything when he made his transition, and at the time, he was mad at them, but now looking back, he looks at his parents with profound gratitude that they did not bend what they knew what was true for him at that moment. And in a way, Sharon, I would say to you, in 20 years, don't be shocked if your grandkids or kids come back to you and say, thank you. Thank you for your willingness to stand for what you knew what was true and right. To just guard, guard that in your heart because you don't know. Okay. Please. Hi, Pam. And, um, <clears throat> sorry, it's very, oh, is it back here? Um, I come from an era in my life that uh, I believe in biblical values and in the truth, just like we're talking here. Yep. Um, when I was growing up, homosexuality was put in prison. S say that one more time. Homosexuality, oh, sodomy. Would put you in prison. Yeah. You were put in prison yep. because that was the law that influence of people who live that lifestyle affects everybody, just like this lady here. Mm. It destroys families. My question is, we have a, a four-year-old grandson that's gonna be uh, before this, in his growing up years, uh, our uh, daughter and, and son-in-law are doing what they can to keep them out of schools that promote this. Oh. As a society, I think we have obligation to fight against this destructive lifestyle, just like we're talking about in the Bible. And uh, what can we do as a society to push back and not just make this a compromising issue that's destroying everybody? Mm -hmm. we, have, we have that obligation, I think, under God to push back. I believe we love those people but they have no right to push us into compromising what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And that's a real an issue I have uh, thought about for a long time. Because yeah. my own sister is in a homosexual relationship. And uh, our daughter, uh, I didn't want her around her mm. thinking that was something that was normal. And I think as a church and society, mm. we had to push back against this. Yeah. It's, it's no. no different than the sin of murder or, or sin, but there's other sins that are, are bad. Yeah. But this one is destroying the fabric of our society. Yeah. And we need to do something about it as a church and as uh, our society. Good. Thank you for your comment. Yeah, yeah, I don't have much to add to it, but thank you for sharing that. Hi, I'm Will. Hi, Will. Um, Feels like AA. Hello, Will. Yeah, I'm Will. Hi, Will. I'm a uh, Christian. Yeah. Something you said earlier, kind of with the question of how we should refer to people, uh, grace and truth. The truth is, no, that's not your gender. And I don't generally go around saying, hey, he is giving me a great, while well, I talk to him. That's not how pronouns work. It's important to love people, but definitely don't dwell on the sin that they're doing. Dwell on God. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Hi. <laughs> My name is Heather. Um, I have a testimony. 
Yes. Um, I grew up in a, in a family where my parents were very against uh, homosexuality, you could be cut off, yes. you know, very extreme uh, Christian mindset. And so that's what I grew up around, the very judgmental. Mm. Um, I, was, uh, I was a ballerina growing up and became professional. And wow. it's full of <laughs> yeah. all sorts of <laughs> what we're talking about. Yep. And so I, as a Christian girl, coming from a very conservative Christian family, um, I had to figure this out. Yep. And not that I have it figured out, but my testimony is, is that through showing God's love to, to anyone, whether they no matter what, who they sleep with and what they call themselves, I always found that if I spoke into them who I, with what I kn knew of what was true, mm. I, would, I, w I wouldn't call them he, she, or even the name sometimes because they change it. I would say, hey, beautiful, how are you mm. doing? Mm. You know, because I know that God made them beautiful. Wow. Mm. Or, hey, handsome, you know? Um, <laughs> throughout my life, many, not just one, but many have come back to who they truly were yes. and have yeah. gotten married and have completely turned their life around and are now in full ministry, full yes. fledged toward this. Yes. And it's all because they were shown God's love yes. and were spoken the truth about them. My grandma was great because she didn't agree how, how strict my parents were. That's a whole other thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they, they always called people by what they saw God in them, mm -hmm. in the whole neighborhood. And so I don't have an answer, yeah. but I know school teachers that call, peop call the kids by nicknames that are Christ-given, mm -hmm. authoritative um, powers to them. Yep. Yep. You know what I mean? Yep. So I encourage everyone not to give up. Yes. And to call people by the truth of what we know is true. Yes. And, and godly. Yes. yes. And my testimony is, is it's always hard to figure out. And that's why you pray. <laughs> A lot, yes. But it changes life to speak life. Yes. So I don't know Beautiful if that helps testimony. anything. Beautiful but testimony. you can call people out with, with what God sees in them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for your vulnerability and sharing that. Beautiful and handsome. I'm going to steal that. <laughs> Stealing that is great. It is lunchtime. Charles is hungry, guys. Charles says, please cut it off so we can eat. Um, let's pray for our meal and dine together if we can. Thank you, yeah, thanks. thanks. Let's pray. Um, God, we're about to eat some good food. Thank you for caring for us and loving us where we are. Um, would you please um, nourish us with not only good food, but good conversation and a good, uh, a good rest of the afternoon. And would you continue to disciple and mold us and form us in the spirit of Christ. Um, we love you, God, and, and we desperately need you. In the name of Jesus, amen.